Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the 2013 reading series of the Writers' Workshop. The, UNO, uh, the UNO's BFA degree in creative writing, located in the College of Communication, Fine Arts, and Media. I'm Anna Minardo, and I know I speak for my whole department when I say how, how happy we are to have been invited by the English department to co-sponsor tonight's event and to welcome to Omaha Nula Ni Yonal, Ireland's foremost present-day poet writing in the Irish language. Uh, in a moment, Dr. Lisbeth Bouchelt of the English department will introduce our guest, but first, a few announcements. Please take a moment to turn off your cell phones. As we move toward the Day of the Dead, we have a few lively events you should know about. This coming Saturday, October 26th at 1 p.m., is the Day of the Dead reading at El Museo Latino, featuring Lisa Sandlin as Santa Teresa, Todd Robinson as Catullus, Thais Flight Genocaro as Federico Garcia Lorca, Scott Glazer as Sancho Panza, and Paul Bozing as Don Quixote. See the Writer's Workshop website for details. On Monday, October 28th at 7.30, the Dead Writers Showcase. Come dressed as your favorite dead writer and read a passage from his or her work. Uh, this event will be in the art gallery of the Weber Fine Arts Building. That's 7.30 next Monday. Do remember that October 31st is the submission deadline for the next issue of the excellent online literary magazine, The 13th Floor, which is edited completely by students of the Writers' Workshop. For more information, 13thfloormagazine.com. And finally, a big thank you to the staff of KVNO Radio, Dana Buckingham, Bill Grennan, and Josh Crone for airing interviews with our visiting writers on the Arts at 8.30 program. In addition, this evening's presentation is being taped live and along with all the other readings this season will air on KVNO Radio. And now, Dr. Bouchelt will, interview our, will introduce our guest. Thank you. Good evening, Ta Falterov, Agus Bawalam, we hosa yal liv as veyan shoa nocht. Hello, welcome, and thank you for being here tonight. I want to thank Anna Minardo and the Writers' Workshop, Bob Darcy, Joe Price, and Jill Sutton of the English Department, and David Peterson of the English Department Dual Enrollment for helping to coordinate and support this event. Additionally, we are very grateful to our community partners, the Omaha Irish Cultural Center and the Father Flanagan Division of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, without whose additional support, this event would simply not be possible. Goro Milamagov, thank you very much. Nulani Yonel was born to Irish parents who were both doctors working in an Irish mining community in Lancashire, England. And at the age of five, she went to live with an aunt in County Kerry, Ireland, where she was immersed in Irish language. As a student at University College Cork, she studied Irish and English and became part of a group of Irish language poets who were published in the literary magazine Inti. But she was more than a poet. She is a playwright and an essayist of considerable insight, humor, and power, and a formidable scholar of Irish literature from the earliest medieval period to whatever was published yesterday. As a poet, Niyonal has been called the most widely known and acclaimed poet in Irish of the century, and she is indeed the first Irish language poet to win a worldwide reputation. Her poetry has been translated into English by a number of well-known Irish poets, including Maeve McGuckian, Paul Muldoon, and the late Seamus Heaney. Irish themes are central to her poetry and range from ancient myths to small details of contemporary life. Her first collection was published in 1981, and the translation, Selected Poems, Roa Danta, appeared in 1986. I first encountered Niyonal's poetry as a graduate student in Irish studies at Boston College 
in a seminar called Irish Medieval Epic in Modern Adaptation. The poem was Lauren Medev, or Maeve Speaks. Having had several years of immersion in the medieval epic tradition already, I knew of Medev, the violent warrior queen of Connacht who goes to war with the equally violent king of Ulster, Conachor, in order to obtain a bull in his possession. That is the bare bones of the medieval Irish epic Poimbo Coolinia, the cattle raid of Cooley. That Medev is often taken to task for being selfish, violent, and indeed altogether too unfeminine in her character. Neonal's Maeve speaks with the voice of any modern woman who has been deemed too outspoken for stating an opinion or for saying no to those who were, in the words of the poem, just looking for a chance to dominate my limbs. Throughout her poetry, Neonal uses characters and symbols that have been a deeply embedded part of Irish culture for hundreds of years rendering them with a deep knowledge of their medieval resonances, while also bringing them well and truly into the modern age. Indeed, in Neonal's poetry, the Celtic otherworld, with its shape changers and mermaids, its powerful fairy folk and haunted landscapes, is demonstrated to be far more relevant to the challenges of modern life than we usually allow ourselves to recognize. When Neonal was given an honorary doctorate from University College Dublin in 2011, Professor Moreni Anrahan said, quote, Nula invokes the other world to acknowledge the mysteries of human suffering and to express respect for those who have suffered trauma or who are in altered states of consciousness of one kind or another. Her mermaids and her gessa, or magical ordinances, are more than metaphors for depression or mental illness. They remind us of human mystery and ward off any reductive response to suffering in a way that is totally modern yet fully recognizable within the Gaelic tradition." End quote. And now it is my great honor and my great privilege to introduce to you Nula Niyono. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the lovely uh, introduction, and I'm delighted. It's quite a turnout for a reading of poetry in Irish. You know? <laughs> this is a lot for Omaha. Um, I was wondering how I'd structure this uh, reading tonight, and I decided I'd mostly do it around the muse, the idea of the muse. Um, I've noticed in all the the lit crit stuff that's being done nowadays that nobody talks about the muse. And um, it was, the muse was a basic part of talking about poetry and has been since, you know, the nine muses way back in ancient Greek history. So I thought I'd, um, I, I haven't written anything critically about this yet, but I think someday, I think I'm working up to it generally. And it's to do the whole idea of a muse. I remember way back when I started off writing poetry that I, I knew I was a muse poet. And I remember saying this to John Montague, an older poet. He was actually taught me um, English at, um, at uh, University College of Cork. And he says, Newly, you can't be a muse poet. That would be like a woman making love to another woman. And we can't have that. <laughs> And I, but I, I knew he was wrong, you know, and I know it has to do with the fact that the muse, well, Julia Kristeva has said that it's the never-to-be-excess body of the mother again, and, you know, fair enough. But, but I do know that the stories we had about the muse have always been from male poets, so it's always a beautiful woman, and it's the unavailable woman, or this or that. But as, um, and, and I know that... Um, uh, Robert Graves did it, did the muse to death, really, basically. We, we all read in, in the 60s, we all read in the 70s, we all read the, uh, the White Goddess and all that stuff. And, um, but as a woman poet, I've worked out that a muse can be actually person, place, or thing, animal, mineral, or vegetable, uh, that we abreact this, this, this image onto something. And that, whatever that thing is at the time, um, becomes the muse. And um, so I, I'll choose that, I, I'll, I'll use that as the, as the theme for the, for the poems tonight. Um, my first poem is a very early poem. It's called uh, La Behirde. 
And it, and it is a muse poem. I'm not sure myself whether the, 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 the person spoken to in the poem, the, the muse, is, a, is male or female, but really it doesn't matter. Um, I'll read the translation myself uh, first in English, and then I'll read the Irish, and I'll do that for the rest of the reading. Um, this is a translation that I did myself because uh, when I started writing poetry, we didn't think of translating. And I was asked to go to Scotland to do a tour. And then I found out that I had to have poems because even though Gaelic in Scotland is very close to Gaelge in Ireland, uh, it's, they're not um, completely uh, mutually comprehensible. So people wanted the translation in English. So I decided, oh, I'll do a translation. And then when I read the translation, I thought, nah. I'm not a poet in English. Um, I kind of think I have a, a, a sort of a killer instinct for the word in Irish, but not in English. This is a mishmash of Wordsworth and all that sort of romantic poetry, and, it, and, the, and the, the registers are all wrong. But anyway, I, I'll give it to you because I have no other translation of it. Uh, and it goes like this. Labashidi, the silken bed. I'd make a bed for you in Labashidi, in the tall grass, under the wrestling trees, where your skin would be silk upon silk in the darkness when the moths are coming down. Skin which glistens shining o'er your limbs like milk being poured from jugs at dinner time. Your hair is a herd of goats moving over rolling hills, hills that have high cliffs and two ravines. And your damp lips would be as sweet as sugar at evening and we walking by the riverside with honey breezes blowing o'er the Shannon and the fuchsias bowing down to you one by one. The fuchsias bending low their solemn heads in obeisance to the beauty in front of them. I would pick a pair of flowers as pendant earrings to adorn you like a bride in shining clothes. Oh, I'll make a bed for you in, in Labashidi, in the twiling hour, twilight hour with evening falling slow. And what a pleasure it would be to have our limbs entwine wrestling while the moths are coming low. Labahirde. The choro in Labagwit, e Labahirde, severe or the omrus goil in the ground. Es vach the cricket now, mar hirde, hirde, se dirichacht, am lonehen na laun. Cricket na hneen go glenach har the jäger, mar vana o goil as krushkini am loin. Es treed gaur a goil tar knokain, the good gruige. Knokain er will fall to order is gogliaun at our dain. Is vech de viola tasher vishlik tukre tra nona shin is bashtorak kushaun. Is na gay himala shade haran shana. Is na fushi a banudit kyaun na kyaun. Na fushi a gishlu a ganam werga a gulushi snolach to sagor. Is the frickin pirak a marhugalini. Is the vasho in the huasa marjidog. O koro in labagwit de labahirde. The house can look and lay in their howl, is before and pleasure going the Giagar Giagar, a gumrus girl, and one of them the lawn. As you can hear, the poetry in Irish is carried very much by the sound. Um, poetry in Irish is very close to song still. I mean, we have the main, until we moderners started off doing, um, trying to be very modern and, 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 uh, doing verse lieb, the main, um, the main form of poetry in Irish was called Madrach the Nauroin, which means the song meter. And it actually does mean what it says, because many of the, uh, of the, um, the most beautiful uh, poems in Ireland over the last three or 400 years uh, are songs, are traditional songs. And, um, and it's that particular connection of the, of the music and the words together. Which, um, which is really the great joy of these poems. Um, but like I said, we all started off um, doing verse libre, um, which I suppose in the 20th century, everybody did do. It's wonderful now that, uh, that, that we've, we, we're in a position now where you can use any form. I mean, everything goes now, which is great, because I do think uh, at a certain point, of, a point, every poet has to come to terms with the, with the older, um, the older forms in their own language, and I've had to come to terms with not just uh, Madrid van Aurein, but also the, the Bardic poems. But it's great. I mean, it's, I feel I've fallen into a gold mine. Keep me going for the rest of my life. Never a dull moment. 
Um, so this is a, an early poem that I wrote, um, and it's to do with the idea of the, um, the muse as being land. There are places that are kind of magic areas. Um, and um, for me, because as, as uh, Elizabeth said, I was sent back to West Kerry when I was very young. Uh, the Dingle Peninsula is my ma magic area, and this is a poem about that. The translation is again by me, because at that time I didn't know anyone else. I didn't know po enough poets in English, so you know you have to know a poet well enough to be able to twist their arm to get a good translation out of them. And at the time I didn't know anyone, so uh, this translation is again by myself. In Balanthle, in Balanthle is Carhale, and below it the house of the Dunleavies. From here the poet Sean went into the great, great blasket. And from here, the red hair and gift of poetry came down to me through four generations. Beside the road, there is a stream covered over with wild fuchsias and the yellow flag wild from the end of April to mid-June. And in the yard, there is a scent of pineapple, mayweed, or chamomile, as it is commonly known in the surrounding countryside, in Killara and in Camaliag, in Bailanchotha and in Caharbuilig. And one day in Carhale, a white trout leapt out of the river and into the bucket of a woman who had led her cows to water there, a time when three ships came sailing into the bay. The eagle was still nesting at the top of the hill, and the sheep of Cahar had spansels of silk. Now, a spansel is what you call, uh, is, is how you tie up sheep so that they don't trespass. And um, I was walking up the village once in the 60s, and in the only dress that I was able to successfully make for myself, it was um, uh, just a piece of silk, which I just sewed up two seams. And I was sashaying up the village, and uh, ma an old man was coming down the village, and he said, oh, it's my the goon, I like your dress. And I said, oh, it's silk. And uh, she then, he said, of course I know it's silk. We had so much silk around here once that we used to tie up the sheep with them. And um, <laughs> I thought, I mean, and, uh, and then he used this line, rank is she, she of the fair queer in the car. And I thought, what a great line, only to find out that actually in the Department of Folklore much later, that um, a ship had been wrecked uh, on, the, um, uh, on one of the islands off the coast, and uh, lots of wine had come in, and also a huge amount of silk. And so maybe it was true, after all. Imalantle. Imalantle, did I read the Irish? No, I didn't. In Maland Lay, Thaka Har Lay, is last this the Tig Winter Green Lay. A son Huygen Phyllis Sean and the Leon, is Wigson Honeygan Gruig Rua, is born the Felix and the Wascom Trichera Gloom. Her haven Vohar Tha Shailan, full of a cream fuchsia, is in Felistrum Buigo Yerevia Brown Galor and Vehev, is a close to Bla Los Aninan, no Kaman Mau, Marahuk Terer Saduhi Temple, Igilere, is a Gamaliag. In my land, Chote is a gahar bulig. Is law a gahar lay the lame brack gal or now on his jacks of bucket or vam a quig lebach on ish gown. An throg or hiol she or a his jacks of one. Gar nadigan fjoller a morak nick. Is gar of lanky she shiada. Fechira na kaharach. Yeah, the Dingle Peninsula is my. I, I once got a great word from a from a Spaniard, a, a peninsular Spaniard, who called it my querencia. And seemingly, uh, in bullfighting, the querencia is the area where, in, in, the, uh, in the arena where the bull uh, feels safest. And the, what the matador has to do is to bring the bull out of the querencia so he can kill it, because in the querencia, you can't kill the bull. And uh, I just thought it was a great, um, a great idea. And I suppose I could say that, um, that the Dingle Palenza is my querencia. And um, every time I, I go through it, something just leaps up out of the landscape. And this, is, uh, this poem is about that happening. Uh, the translation is by Michael Cody. Driving West. Every nook of this peninsula can speak to me in its own tongue in words I understand. There's not one twist of road or little grove that can't insinuate its whispered courtship at my ear. I've crossed the Connor Pass a thousand times if I've gone once, yet each time it unveils new stories 
revelations clear to me as rocks along the road, as actual as words articulated. Loch Gyal bedazzles me today as when, each seventh year, the great carabuncle heaves up from the deep and shoulders into air to slough for scales, freshwater shellfish that the people gather. And there's Knokan Igor, still peopled by a tale of 700 beardless shawns butchered as the English marched on Dunanor. Out of the mist, a jingle swims nonsensically, little white daisies and horse dung. It sends me lilting on my way and sweeps me down to Dingle. At the Vaughan Shear, Lauren Gakuna than Lahini Shalom in the Tanga Fenig, Tanga Ahigim, Ni Lub the Quil na Kur the Vohor na Vila Serilim, a Kugernil is a Shiskernig. Tant Connor Gaffagum Mila Hur Matasha Gaffa A and Ur Wainagum. Fos Glashum Skeltano Wi Gach Ila Ur, Less than the Tishk in a Kurin the Karigrach and the Shas of a Lauren Vohorum, Fay Maravak Pokil Alm. In Yuvta Sullas or Lockgal, La Lassa Suas, Marayinan and Carabuncle, Ur Gach Shach Dublin, Nur Yairin Shal, and Nis Gohort and Nalehe is Krahan Brat Ganije, Balian Winter in the Hotter and the Schligan Aus some Marvia. Is Erma Yesh Tok Nakon, they go, Mara Maria Thraw de Rare and Scale, Shach Gieth Sean Gan Fesog, Is Nasasanig a Marshal or Gunan Or. Asim Gyo. Nothing la Howard D. K. Lee account. No nini bon agus cock couple. Scoob on the yidem rihmule, she's a stach on dangame. One of the things about uh, the, the, the peninsula is that uh, I've heard so many stories about it, and I think that ultimately a landscape, you know, it's only rocks and stones and, and, and grass and stuff until we. we um, project our paysage interior onto it. And I think that we have in Irish uh, a form of, of literature called Dean Chanachas, which is a, a, a place name lore. And I think that's what we have been doing for thousands of years, walking around the countryside, telling stories about it. And uh, um, one of the stories, of course, is, um, is about, uh, you know, every field has, has a story. And, um, some of the stories have things like banshees in them. You know, the banshee is a harbinger of death. If you, you know, you hear the banshee, there's various ways of hearing her. You can hear her crying or you can hear her rapping on the door. And uh, we're coming up to, um, to uh, uh, Halloween, which of course is the ancient Celtic um, beginning of the year when the doors between this world and the other world are open. And uh, um, my students in, in Notre Dame were asking me, what do you do in Ireland in Halloween? I say, we tell ghost stories. And basically, um, that's, um, that's what we do. And walking around the country, too, you, you, you think about these stories, about you know, ghost stories. This is a field where a banshee was heard, and this is, you know, this is a, a fairy fort which you wouldn't dare go into or sleep in. You can go into them in the daytime, but you wouldn't dare sleep in one. And of course, if you, um, if you knock one down, you're sure to die a, 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 very un, un, a very bad death, and very soon. Mind you, I've heard a few cases where people have, have gone in with JCBs and haven't been found dead in their bed in the morning. And that's really frightening, because that means, that, that means that there are no gods left. <laughs> anyway, this is about... Um, uh, going to visit, my, my mother's people are from the west of the peninsula, and then there's this, this uh, very, well, it's, it's not high, it's only 3,000 feet, but it's the second highest mountain in Ireland, um, um, Mount Brandon. But what makes it uh, seem high is that it comes straight up from sea level to 3,000 feet within two miles. So, you know, that's, my husband's a geologist, he said, well, actually, the, the Alps are a bit like that, except you start from higher up. Um, and, um, and this is about going over the, the, the past to see to my father's side of the country and, 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 and just um, thinking about it. And, and thinking especially of the, the banshee that is associated with that part of the country. And uh, it's been translated by uh, Paul Muldoon as Dora Dooley. Over the Connor Pass I come to visit my relations, but they're not at home. So I drive straight on towards Brandon Point. The houses on the Mahari Islands glisten like so many Kerry diamonds, 
And there's a weird life, light of the bay, like a rainbow that's only partially bent. If I should now come upon the banshee Dora, Dora Dooley on her way to Keane, the Fitzgeralds of Murgoyne, with her cloak of green astrakhan and a lapdog under her oxterine, a chihuahua undoubtedly, I wonder if I might have the wit and the presence of mind to ask her if she happens to know what it would take to lift the spell on the sunken fort that lies here under the sea swell with this weird light hanging over it like an incomplete rainbow. It's more likely, though, that I'd merely give her a wave as she went by, just as I did only a short time ago to a little old local lady. Dora Dile. Trust name Mom Connorok or Horish Mugelta is Neil Shadam. Is the man in Lum Queen Deerak arrived in Dros Rivrin. Tatihan the Makaria Gliskernach Maklokaskoil is Leaser and Nishkam or Vaushin and Lon is Ganam Baulifoil. The more than initially, a man she, Dora the Lays, he attacked the Queen of Yarlthig Murgon. Shanavanin Leif in a cloak of Wehnis, Mother Badith in a huskel, Shawani floor. Neither and Maxia the Vauragum is the Aram Keen Fieri. Cada winner and drear than Dun Idrigog Row, a tall in Snahishki he's is an lesser o Sikun Marskoil. No banabal, the Givanon Degoshin please, he had all her broad. Femara Yinisanish o Hienevin. Leban, or not. Um, that's the land as, uh, as muse. Uh, but what I also noticed was um, when I had small children, that, that the children uh, became muses. Um, I suppose they could still be muses, but it was especially um, pronounced when they were smaller. And um, this is a poem called A Kaholinev. And it's about the, that particular period when you're breastfeeding a child, when there's a symbiotic relationship between you and the child, and you don't know where you end and the child begins. And, and it's, it's, it's an extraordinary um, period. And um, it took a long time for this poem to kind of find its place. But it's nice to know that, that at this stage, uh, a daughter, the daughter of mine about whom it is written has actually gone and used it in her MA about um, symbiotic relationships. And uh, so maybe, you know, maybe its time has come. Um, but um, it, it is a very special time. And, um, and what came into my mind was all the dandling songs and the, and the uh, fairy tales and everything else. And they, they sort of, um, you know, the, the, one's sense of reality is different. It's a marvelous phase, and uh, I'm glad I wrote it then because I couldn't write it now because I've long forgotten what it was like. But um, so this is a poem from that period when the children were muses. It's called Feeding a Child. From honeydew of milking, from cloudy heat of beastings, the sun rises up the back of bare hills, a guinea gold to put in your hand my own. You drink your fill from my breast and fall back asleep into a lasting dream, laughter on your face. What is going through your head, you who are but a fortnight on earth? Do you know day from night that the early, great early ebb announces spring tide, that the boats are on deep ocean where live the seals and fishes and the great whales and are coming hand over hand, each by seven oars manned? That your small boat swims o row in the bay with the flippered peoples and the small sea creatures. She's slippery sleek from stem to bow, stirring sea sand up, sinking sea foam down. Of all these things are you ignorant? As my breast is explored by your small hand, you grunt with pleasure, smiling and senseless. I look into your face, child, not knowing if you know your herd of cattle graze in the land of giants, trespassing and thieving, and soon you will hear the fee fi fo fum sounding in your ear. You are my piggy who went to market, who stayed at home, who got bread and butter, who got none. There's one good bite in you, but hardly two. I like your flesh, but not the broth thereof. And who are the original patterns of the heroes and giants, if not me and you? A kohulinev. As kyo malon vanya, as brohul skamlok moehil. Irene and Green de Grim the Moel Clock, Marhini Or, the Kur i the Glack, a Thor. 
All in through the hall, I'm here, Christian and Shirith, who on the Stachadire of Buen, Tagar Erdognush. Gata Gwalt Truth Yahun, to Sanach will lack like Kaiki sound. An old lit and law on me here, Gwil Mokrag Boer, a Fogger Trowerter, Gwil Nabod, Gadain, Savari Gemara Willesh, Gisron, the Smilt, the Moor, the Tacter, Vush, the Zervash, the Zerhak, the Maddy Rara, Gwil the Void in the Snow, Vorosa Huan, the Snell Lupadain, Lupadain, Moran Nine, Moran Nine, Eager Slim Slown, a Hun Good Count, a Cor Gran, the Farrigan Wachter, is Corn, the Farrigan Echter, Arisa Illa, and Buller Fay Nahim, is the Gorni Bugger, a Gwalt, or Machia. Tanto a gnuas a clatanev, a mangle me heel. Fiacham snigger the linev is nether and weatherish, go will the bolock, the geneer it all of Navach, a slad is a bradiacht, a snach father go glusher and fee five o, fum a jack tar the goelna in ear. The sum of a keen a hui germarga, a gana gipale, a for a raw nagazim is na for dada, is morlem de gramto, a gazes bioglum de gorgeim, is malem the good fuel, a ni malem the good anore. Is Kehid Pottering Vonig in the Lech as Navahak, on their Husse, is Misha. And I'll read one more of these um, poems where, where the children were, were um, the muse. And this is a poem called Dawn the Melissa. I wrote it for my daughter Melissa, and I made a terrible mistake because I put her name in it. And it turned out, they, they put it on the leading certificate school uh, uh, um, course in Ireland, so every Every child in the country had to learn this off for their leaving certificate. And, and you know, she, she never forgave me because she said, you know, I can't go into a pub without somebody coming up to, say, uh, to me and saying, are you the Melissa Thorne, the Felissa? And, um, and she says, you know, that's very annoying because I have a perfectly good life of my own outside of that poem. <laughs> um, but I think she's finally forgiven me, but I learned something very important not to put people's names into poems, because the next time I wrote a poem about her, I called her Persephone. <laughs> <laughs> poem for Melissa. My fair-haired child dancing in the dunes, hair be ribboned, gold rings on your fingers, to you, yet only five or six years old, I grant you all on this delicate earth. The fledgling bird out of the nest, the iris seeding in the drain, the green crab walking neatly sideways, they are yours to see, my daughter. The ox would gamble with a wolf, the child would play with the serpent, the lion would lie down with the lamb, in this pastoral world I would delicately grant. The garden gates forever open wide, no flaming swords and hands of cherubim, no need for a fig leaf apron here, in this pristine world I would delicately grant. O oh, white daughter, here's your mother's word, I will put in your hand the sun and the moon, I will stand my body between the millstones in God's mills, so you are not totally ground. Don the Velissa. Ma fostin fion a rink a green a dihe, rivin yet yawn as fawny o'er the verinthe, ditch enough will foes, a go quig no shay the vlienthe, till em gaka will sit down, mean, mean. An garkach ain a lame to stoin the nidde, an felistrum a pecha in sediag, and part down glass of shul fear scowka nieta, is let the eid, the thort fenera, a neem. Yachandava sugri lish a madra alta, and neen on a glacus lish a naher nee, lee hach and loan she's lish an oon kairach, so down or no a run in earth, mean, mean. Vak gathi and guardian or lahagamachus could yanach, ni vak clitter lustraga ara a caribbean, near gogget de lur figure mornapron eather, so down or no a run in earth. Mean, mean. Se inin vaan sha dervu o the vaarin ga merim ar lovgut an yalachas am yrian is ga shesim lem karp pain id ar gav ro an willin in will today chan a melfi tu mean, mean. Um, back to the muse again. Of course, uh, as a woman poet, um, you know, like the muse doesn't have to be a woman always. I decided, what about the muse as a man? And um, th these are poems I wrote mostly in the 80s, uh, when, um, when women's, women poets were coming mainstream, were coming online, basically, in Ireland. And, um, um, well, it was a difficult, you know, from being the subject, from being the muses of the male poets, it was a difficult, sub it was a difficult task to 
from being the, the objects all the time, it was difficult to become the subject. And, you know, we, we went for it, and we won. So I used to be very annoyed. I wrote uh, polemics and all sorts of things at the time. I used to be very annoyed about it, but I'm not annoyed anymore because we won. We've won that battle. Um, but uh, at the time, yeah, you know, there were different ways of, of tackling it. So I decided that, you know, poems were, poems were a good way of tackling it too. Now, I mean, I, I didn't have a, an agenda. Uh, well, I had a general ad agenda, but but you know they, they are kind of love poems too in a way. Um, the first one I'll read is called Ilon, and um, it's been translated by by John Montague. And um, Ireland, you see, has has always been considered a woman, and that was one of the problems for us women poets because every time you got outside the door, you were carrying the map of Ireland on on your back, <laughs> and um, and so, so we, um, like I said, we, 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 we did different things to, uh, for instance, Eve Ann Boland has written very, very well about this. She's written very wonderful articles about this. And, um, and so Ireland as woman, so I got fed up of Ireland as woman. So I thought, what would it be like to think of man as land for a change? So I thought about it. And for the life of me, I couldn't think of a place that was, you know, a land that was, or, you know, that was, over, that was coming down with, you know, with milk and honey or something like that. All I could think of was the Blasket Islands. Now, anyone who's been to Ireland and knows the Blasket Islands realizes that, you know, it's a very hostile environment. And uh, friends of mine, you know, poets who happen to be men say, Nuala, Nuala, you're projecting onto us. And I said, right. <laughs> What have you been doing to us for the last 2,000 years? <laughs> so this is how it worked out. Um, island. Your nude body is an island, a sprawl on the ocean bed. How beautiful your limbs spread eagled under seagull's wings. Spring wells your temples, depths of blood, honey crests. A cooling fountain you furnish in the furious sweltering heat and a healing drink when feverish. Your two eyes gleam like mountain lakes on a bright Lammas day when the sky sparkles in dark waters. Your eyelashes are reeds rustling along the fringes. And if I had a tiny boat to waft me towards you, a boat of findrini not a stitch out of place from top to bottom but a single plume of reddish brown to play me on board, to hoist the large white billowing sails, thrust through foaming seas, and come beside you where you lie back, wistful emerald, as an island. Elan the shadow harp, the lorn the maramoire, ta the yega spreta er varilin, glegal os farica fuilen. Te bruka fierishke yed the she is the actor follower her is the actor mala, who her dish for random malarm of verihin is Jack Slanahis of Yverus. Ta the ga hoil marlocha schle, la bra lunas and the ravine and spare a glinon and the hishki, gilkik scobacha yed the tauri, a fast fenagush. Is the Machagum body in contact with the Yain? Body in Fundrin and Barclet and Macherin, a Bunclet and Stacher, a Hain Clet to Wine, Rim and Darrag, a Dean of Kill, the Hain or Board. Hokin Swiss and the Shoal to Bogabon, a Bogotica, Rauhin to Ariga Orde, its Hokin Hoods, Maralientu, Uignach, Eaglas, Elona. Um, I'll read another one uh, like that. It's um, again, it's, it's a love poem. But um, uh, I think it's written with a certain ironic detachment. Um, I, I called it Ganda um, Khadiyadig, and um, Paul Muldoon translated it as nude. And people have said to me, that's one word in English for four words in Irish. I know, but it means without your clothes on in Irish. But, but Paul, is right, Paul is right to call it nude because it is an answer to the nude tradition. I mean, not just in, in poetry, but also in the in, in visual art. We you know you know we know about you know all, you know we know about the whole the the, the phallocentric look and all that stuff, and um, you know we know about the, um, the the women who are in the especially in pictures who are there looking knowingly, knowing that men are looking at them and all that sort of thing. So I decided I'd I'd. Um, I said, what's, uh, you know, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. So this is, um, this is um, my version of it. Uh, the translation is by Paul Muldoon. Nude. 
The long and short of it is I'd far rather see you nude. Your silk shirt and natty tie, the brolly under your oxter in case of a rainy day, the three-piece seersucker suit that's so incredibly trendy, your snazzy loafers and la-di-da, a pair of gloves made from the skin of a doe. Then to top it all, a crumby hat set at a rakish angle. None of these add up to more than the icing on the cake. For unbeknownst to the rest of the world, behind the outward show lies a body unsurpassed for beauty, without so much as a wart or blemish, but the brilliant slink of a wild animal, a dream cat sing on the prowl, leaving murder and mayhem in its wake, your broad, sinewy shoulders and your flank, smooth as the snow on a snowbank, your back, your slender waist, and of course, the, the root that is the very seat of pleasure, the pleasure source. Your skin so dark, my beloved, and soft, as silk with a hint of velvet in its weft, smelling as it does of meadow sweet or water mead that has the power, or so it said, to drive men and women mad. For that reason alone, if for no other, when you come with me to the dance tonight, though, as you know, I'd much prefer to see you nude, it would probably be best for you to pull on your pants and vest, rather than send half the women of Ireland totally round the bend. <laughs> Is Farlam to Ganda Kudia the Gurt, the Lena Hida is the Caravat, the Ska Farinefe Tuskel is the Hlutri Fisa Fashinta, Le Bar Fiausch Tolurachte, the Vroga Ermin the Goni Snas, the Lavini Krikanelita or the Vush, the Hatha Crumbi Ferica or Air and the Klusha, Nikunja then Ruinele the Hurishk, Marhis Fuhing on this than Slua, the Karpkan Bashle Vokel Nami Vua, Lu Furik than the Alta, Kat Muravi and the Musanihe is the Ogan Skile in the Varapra. The Gul Nelehan Farshing is the Hev, Koshlim Lishnak the Sheta, Erin Schlieve. The Gram the Vasa Shingle is at Gaul and Ruther, Gul Bar Pleshura Aun. The Kriken at Ako Doraka is Schlieve, Leshia the Gemachtus Velvet in the Neve, is Er Hurak Darigat Luchra no Mag Nahon, Gunnerthurfe, Gul Suha Faris Banan. Marshins the Avrishin is to a wrinkle in a nacht, Kagan Marlam to Gan the Kudia de Gart, Bader Naraven Dival the Glaes and Nisher and Dirt, and under the Lap Banairin. A villa is a lot. Um, having kind of gone through that phase, um, I began to think a lot about, about the language and the language change. And the fact that my mother's generation would have grown up in the, the sort of uh, pulsating amoeba of the Irish language village in the west of Ireland and, um, and then educated themselves into English and into the middle classes, and the kind of some of the problems that uh, th th that happened, and I thought I'd um, I'd image the whole thing by thinking of um, of a, a group of mer people that came up on land. Now I didn't want to use the word mermaid because that's a very limited amount of the population. I wanted uh, I wanted you know men and women and children and adults, and uh, so I resurrected the word maruch, which was actually um, not used in in the written um, in, in the written language, but is there in the folk language for mer person, and it's nice because it's it's not gendered and it can you know it can be, so you can have a wider um, a wider. Uh, amount of the population in it. And we have this image, we, this idea in Ireland of the land under wave, that there's a, just beyond Ireland, there's this land under wave, and that, that, that um, it's a sort of a, a magic land. And I thought, hmm, what would it be like to come up from the sort of uh, amniotic fluid of, of, this, of this land under wave and come up onto the hard rocks of English? And I know it's a bit of a, of a sort of a, Essentialist, maybe the whole idea, but then the poems kind of took on a life of their own, and uh, and I think they um, they, they um, well they did take on a life of their own. I mean, at a, at a one stage there, everything I read or everything I looked at turned into mermaids, and um, and I have a whole book here called uh, in English the the um, the, um, the fifty minute mermaid because. The 50 minute hour is not only the academic hour, but it's also the um, therapeutic hour. And you can imagine, my mermaid spent an awful lot of time in therapy. And, um, and um, these are some of the, the, the stories that they have. 
Um, let me read the first one. On Verruchsen Hospital, the, the Mermaid in Hospital. I got the idea from, from Oliver Sacks' book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. About, it's about, um, there's one story in it about a man who woke up in hospital. He had some sort, of a, uh, some sort of a lesion in his brain, and he woke up in hospital, and he found this, what he thought was a dead leg in the bed with him. And uh, he fected out of the room. And of course, he fell out of it, with it because it was his own leg, <laughs> because whatever had happened in his brain, he, his body image had changed. And I thought, oh, there's my mermaid. Because, you know, I know that the first mermaid story I ever heard myself was, of course, the Hans Christian Andersen one. And, and the line in that that really struck me was that when she, when her tail was cut off and her, her legs were put on, that every step she took was like a thousand knives going up through her. And so I was thinking that, you know, maybe it wasn't so pleasant after all. And anyway, she definitely had a trouble with the body image. So this is the mermaid in the hospital. She awoke to find her fishtail clean gone. But in the bed with her, there were these two long thingamies. You'd have thought they were tangles of kelp or collops of ham. They're no doubt taking the piss, it being New Year's Eve, half the staff legless with drink it. This is an Irish hospital. And the other half playing pranks. Still, this is taking it a bit far. And with that, she hurled the two thingamies out of the room. But here's the thing she still doesn't get. Why she tumbled out after them, arse over tip. How she was connected to those two thingamies and how they were connected to her. It was the sister who gave her the wink and let her know what was what. You have one leg attached to you there and another one underneath that. One leg, two legs, a one and a two. Now you have to learn what they can do. In the long months that followed, I wonder if her heart fell, the way her arches fell, her instep arches. And Vruchs no spadil. Gushishis near of a herbalish gowny smo, a kashtiksa lavalevi and dorad for the forsa. Bogolath gur gad vare eid no slamaki fiola. Marvaga tosh in ni flor e hen the kadamore, the land the forness and merle jockas and la elica row hook of the joke on the Martian henis lorem ages, the hush and dora the makas a shomra. Akshahi and quid, not thick and she. Kunz the hit she fain in the near cocks and bowhead. Ken went to be in dora lay, though Ken went to be a kilosan. On vanaltra hugan noddies, a quiddy e jo and oish. Cuss e show at that cangle to deeth. Agus kian elica an se hís fút, cos cos ella a hén a dó, cahadú fálam conas siúlló. In sna mís a fada a lán nádar ar hít a crí de réir mar a hít, tróch na cosirhe a hór sí. Um, so I was working out what it would be like for mermaids to come up on land, and then I thought that um, one of the things would be that they'd be in denial. You know, they'd pretend, you know, that they had always lived in land. And you know, that's a reasonable enough reaction. And, um, and so this is the, the poem that I got out of that idea, which is um, that the mermaid didn't want to be reminded of anything to do with water. And there are an awful lot of words in Irish for water. And uh, so that I go through the list of them. The mermaid and certain words. Whatever you do, don't mention the word water or anything else that smacks of the sea. Wave, tide, ocean, the raging main, the briny. She does soon contemplate the arrival of frost in the middle of summer, then hear tell of fishing, boats, seine or tram trammel nets, lobster pots. She knows that such things exist, of course, and that other people have truck with them. She thinks if she covers her ears and turns away her head that she'll be free of them. And she'll never hear again the loud neighing of the Kelpie or water horse claiming its blood relation with her in the darkest hour of night, causing her to break out in goose pimples and having sweat lashing off her while she's fast asleep. She hates nothing so much as being reminded of the underwater life that she led before she turned over a new leaf on dry land. She totally denies that she had the slightest connection with it at any time. I never had any interest in those old superstitions or any of the old traditions. Fresh air, knowledge, the shining brightness of science are all I ever hankered after. I wouldn't mind one way or the other, but I myself have found her out in the deception. 
In the Department of Irish Folklore in University College Dublin, there is a whole manuscript in the school's collection that was set down by her, written in water, with a fin of a ray for a pen on a long scroll of kelp. In it can be found 13 long tales and odds and ends of other ones, together with charms, old prayers, riddles, and such like. From her father and her grandfather, she mostly took them down. She refuses to accept its existence, and when she does, it was the master who gave it to us as homework way back in the national school. We had to do it. There was no getting out of it. She would prefer to suffer a heavy nosebleed rather than admit she ever had a hand in its composition. An vrug agus fokal arhe, na luig an fokal ischgele, na eni a winen le kursi farige, taun, tide, bochne, muir, no sarle. Ni lule an shuk sarig na tracht a klas er iskut baard sani tran a tramle potigle mach. Tasig i gmag vil le hedi an is kmin gital egne winnislo a shuig din elle. Kapen si magun an si a klusis mach as na kyan gmesi serere. Is not Clashishi Boor Gor, a Mech Ishke, a Fogart Gil, Chirile, Godain Sanihe, a Kur Granini or a Cricken is brought Alish a Machtril or a Colleship. Nil Ain Naud Eleke, a Hansel for Heen, a Clashi, Sar Umpic, she are a Hassel, er an Mintir, a Kurguini. Shen and she ovang, Grev Iridis Kachniga the Winter Kilish, Ainam. Near Ran Tim Ravagums, the Pishogus and non end sort Shanaim Shukta. Air all the solace glenach no holeachta, as a hauntis. O comelum, a covurus max ne hoche. A stig serine le biela dis erin, tal love scriven um lawn the value con the skull, brackaho on a live, screech and ischke le clip of the ski hon roha, a scohog pamanum or four. Ta trichin diag the skilta fada gismatheca the keen ele down to le hor he shana fadraca tosh nagazarilla, le tort venera on. On a hair is on a mar clean as mo a hog she she said. Jewel thin she glanda. And master a hog mar uber by laguine for though here's the vunskar. Ha hammer a yenov. Near a vend the lassagin. Ha hog she fuil frown. Saramek she reev ad volach in the hunskinov. And so that's the generation who come up on land. But what happens to the next generation? Uh, so I was thinking, yeah, they would even spend more time in therapy. Um, because, you know, can you imagine? Can you imagine trying to live without water? Can you imagine, you know, coming from the water and trying to live without? And I do feel there are a lot of people in Ireland who pretend that Irish doesn't exist. And I think it's no different than pretending that water doesn't exist. And, um, and um, so this poem is called A Recovered Memory of Water. Sometimes when the mermaid's daughter is in the bathroom cleaning her teeth with a thick brush and baking soda, she has the sense the room is filling up with water. It starts at her feet and ankles and slides further and further up over her thighs and hips and waist. In no time at all, it's up to her oxters. She bends down into it to pick up hand towels and wash towels and other such things are, as are sodden with it. They all look like seaweed like those long strands of kelp they used to call mermaid hair or foxtail. Just as suddenly the water recedes, and in no time the rooms completely dry again. A terrible sense of stress is part and parcel of these emotions. At the end of the day, she has nothing else to compare it to. She doesn't have the vocabulary for any of it. At her weekly therapy session, she has more than enough to be going on with, just to describe the strange phenomenon and to express it properly to the psychiatrist. She doesn't have the terminology or any of the points of reference or any word at all that would give the slightest suggestion as to what water might be. A transparent liquid, she says, doing as best she can. Right, says the therapist, keep going. He cajoles and coaxes her towards word making. She has another run at it. A thin flow, she calls it, casting about gingerly in the midst of words. A shining film, dripping stuff, something wet, which is a very inadequate description of water. And like I say, is, um, is um, what happens when people refuse to admit, you know, that things have been lost, but we can also get them again. Kuina Anishke. We're in Tindurivina Hinin, Sishomra Folka, Glana, Afiakla, Lest, Let, Chuv. Is the sold bacala, ticked her digulian and the chomra swiss lehishke. 
Thus, nain jig a cussus, a routinius, being jay schliberal suus, a suus a reach, haramasus, a cromine is a vasta. Ni father gomin she shis goodies in the huskadian. Cromin she she sang gominic, a pioca suus ruddy mar huile alive, no kirjaka a tarm wesam. Ta common the famanera. The scohog of father kelpa uda dogadish, gruig viden vara, no erabil vadri rura. And sung gohoban ten and tish tishke in ishk, as ni father gomin and shomra, amlan, trim, a reached. Tas trus u vasak a rindlish na muhu khan shagler jason tail nil rudar be ke kun kumparadi an vlesh is nil na fokal kart da rola sike er korbe egen session shike terapok shak the nul bin a do hin do ke a gear and skill ashtak sha a vinu is a khir nul e gart an vargochtur nil en termik the ke no termi tagra na fokal er be a hora kan tur mes lu do kade ishke lacht tre yaraka edershi a dean of a cream deal. Sha, a dare in therapy, kin of earth. Been she a mulla is a grisa con gneve tangum. Didn't she ear a fella? Slay a tanny a hugging cheer. Yatoria go curumach a mask no vocal. Brat glainer. Over shilter. Rod fluk. Rod fluk, a wet thing. And that, you know, that's as close as you can get to describing what water is. Um, yeah. I finish actually by uh, trying something out. I'm only going to read this poem in, um, in Irish, but I'll set it up in English. Why I'm only going to read it in Irish is because it's a, it's a sound poem. And it's, it's based on a very uh, simple color um, uh, a very simple uh, dichotomy, which is, you know, uh, the word black and the word white. And the word in Irish for black is dove. Mind you, in Northern Ireland, it's called do, but that wouldn't work in this poem, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, dove is black, and bon is, uh, is white. Now, first of all, I want to say that this has absolutely no racial connotations whatsoever, because the word in Irish for black people is gorum, fear gorum, uh, blue, actually. So, uh, and that's been there. That's actually been attested uh, since the fragmentary annals back to the year 18, no, 827, when seemingly the uh, Lochlanig, the Vikings, whose uh, capital was Dublin at the time, uh, went down off the coast of Mauritania and had a big sea fight with the um, winter of Mauritania, the people of Mauritania, and brought some of them back to Dublin. And it says, Hugadar Lo, winter of Mauritania, i.e., Fir Gorma. And so, um, so that's the first thing to tell. Now, the second thing is, you know, the word bon has usually very positive connotations. You know, it, it's a term of affection, my white-headed boy and that sort of thing, um, bon. But there is one place where the word has a very negative connotation, and that's, mean, that's when it's, uh, when it's um, connected with land. And years ago, when I was in secondary school, we were translating uh, De Bello Gallico by Caesar into Irish, and we used to wor use the word bonim to make white for, for what he used to use the word in Latin, vasto vastare, which means to lay waste. And at the time, I was, I don't think I was emotionally, I think I was too emotionally naive to understand what that meant. It was only years afterwards that I, I realized that as another Irish poet called him, um, uh, Julius Caesar was a black and tan. He was worse than that. Seemingly, historians have said that in the six years that he was vastoing and vastarying all over Gaul, he killed one, one and a half million Celts. And they're my people, you know? And, um, and you know, considering the, the lower population base at the time, you know, that was genocide. And he did it basically because he needed money and he, liked, he wanted the loot. And uh, so, um, so it was only much later that I had a different view of, of, um, of Judas Caesar. But the other thing about it is, um, and like I said, we, it didn't mean much to us then, until years later, I remember being looking out at the landscape with this uncle of mine, who was this man who was married to my aunt, and he was telling me how his people had come from somewhere else and landed in the village where they are now after the famine. And I said, um, but wasn't there anyone there before you? And he said, no. Ni rev, eina auna duce, via not born. The land was white. In other words, 
totally desolate. And it was only then that I think I began to understand what the depths of the word meant. And it all came back to me um, when, um, uh, when, when uh, Radko Miladzic went into Srebrenica in um, 1995 in July. And I remember a Thursday he went in and he gave sweets, it was on the television, he gave, he gave cho sweets to the children. And I remember thinking, that doesn't sound good. And then you saw the people being divided up and the men putting on some buses and the women on the others. And I said, that also doesn't sound good. And then there was a, a news blackout. And then on the Monday, I wrote this. And I couldn't understand what it was, really. And um, I couldn't understand the aesthetics of it until I realized that the doof, doof, doof was actually the uh, sound of the gunshots killing the people. Uh, and I must have picked it up in the air or somewhere. And uh, the second thing was that, um, that um, well, it was almost an impossible situation. And um, what really, really gave it a terrible irony was that I had just read in um, Noel Malcolm's short history of Bosnia that the word Srebrenica meant the city of silver, uh, that it, um, there had been um, uh, silver mines there since Roman times. Argentaria is what the, what the Romans called it. And I had this vision of this, you know, white silver, you know, the shining city being born, this, you know, Kahervon being born in the other sense. And this is really what the poem is all about. And it's called, I'll, like I say, I've set it up in English and I'll just do it in Irish. And it's called Dove. Er hitum srebrenitsa an eno la diag de uil milenediak neaka sukuig. Is la dovesha, tan spare dove, tan arigadove, tan na gardini dove, tan a cream dove, tan a knick dove, tan a busna dove, tan a car na hug na postier sculler madden dove. Tan a shuppy dove, ta vinoga dove, tan a stridna dove is nila dine, eh? tan a noch dine a yellen and kalin dove go will and fault lighter dove he, dove, dove, dove. Tan dav dove, tan gar dove, ta kapal ud i brahig dove, ta gak kare in the skin and makas and alta dove, and kira gove has na makta gono a lauren tre the ni hesh gak di nismo, mar tan a kiriger fad dove. Tan a prati dove, tan a turnapi dove, ta gak pillo kubash ta hit kurfa shisa dor kain dove. Tan saspan dove, tan kittel dove, ta gak ton karpan a sugga pal ti libain dove. Tan a katlikig dove, tan a protestunig dove, tan a serbig as na croatig dove, ta gach ilichina hulen and drumpel na krina and vaiden govs a sarig dove. Tan a politikiori a skibba, is a bwint na gossus na nerbal da chele, a gyrachor na lirin na kvada gomeg gach dove in the yal, as you can understand from my tone of voice, that's about politicians. Is an te a lohok a vishnachto, ni kretak an meid a derenchid, gyr beidir, nar vishta gyr beidir an keshta akar, ac a ban na valig a chelin se sa nishnach, Meg in skacht of Freysha, ach shell. Ach ni yenitze, mer tamshed of, tam a creed of, tam a intent of, tam maverk or feg rain marakt of, tam dovish diggers a mahogan coin, gak peace a goil no smear no orna, gak down no deal no daradale, gak klete fig varen no ekter van vroege, gak uiv no cow no tal tona, gak diagon dine a flog on our nocus, tam dov, dov, dov. Marta shrebrenitze, kaher on arigid. Argentaria and Aladna, born. Grimila Mahagas. <laughs>